So please welcome Vandana, my dear friend, to speak to you this evening. Vandana Shiva. <laughs> and it's your love and friendship that has allowed me to keep coming back over 20 years. And, uh, and the beauty of 20 uh, years of an institution, a, a courageous institution, a bold institution, uh, to really do learning for our times. And uh, that it's not just sustained itself. But I find on this visit has totally new energy with an amazing team. Um, that also brings me joy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you're wondering what I'm going to talk about with Beyond Development. Um, I could talk about the development machine. But I want to begin by paying tribute to the person from whom I learned about the original meaning of development, Brian Goodwin who used to also be, who started the Holistic Science MSc at Schumacher. And for years, we had worked together. And he was an amazing source of knowledge of biology. You know, I grew up as an illiterate on biology. I, I went to physics. And in fact, I ran away from biology class because they chopped up cockroaches. <laughs> there was to be something called dissection, as if you couldn't figure out how, what life is till you destroyed it. Um, and, and Brian's the one who, who said that development in biology, in the life sciences, is the process by which a seed becomes a tree and an embryo becomes a person. Now, a seed of an acorn becomes an oak tree, and it knows it must become an oak tree. And it does interact. It's not that it's isolated. It interacts. But its interaction is self-guided. The embryo becomes an adult. And the three or four qualities of that development of life in evolution, of life processes as self-organized, self-regulated, self-directed, self-governed, is first freedom. Because self-organization is freedom. Self-regulation is freedom. And because of freedom, even though every wheat seed will give you a wheat plant and more wheat seeds, you don't have to keep telling the wheat seed, don't become a cabbage. <laughs> yeah? It's free to become itself, but it's free to become itself in diversity. So if you're you know, if your parents had two kids, the two of you weren't clones of each other. You, you took your own shape. And then part of that was then influenced by the interaction between the relationships and that inner self-organized structure. And those interactions, too, were shaped by that. And um, two scientists, Maturella and Varela, have, uh, Maturana and Varela, have talked about this as an autopoietic system self-organized and growing from within. And one more of our dear friends who used to do economics courses, mm. um, the, the Chilean, um, the tall... Um, art, no, 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 the Chilean... Um, uh, Wolf, uh, Manfred Maxero. Manfred Maxero, the economist, wrote this beautiful book, From the Inside Looking Out. Yeah. So living development is from the inside looking out. And diversity is its second nature. Harmony is another characteristic. So you're going to be doing permaculture courses and you're starting a permaculture farm. And in any permaculture system, in any ecologically sustainable system, the, not only does the plant know exactly how much nitrogen, phosphorus, iron, potassium to pick up, but there's always an amazing balance and a cooperation. You know, if you find out now about the relationships between between plants through the fungi in the soil, the mycorrhizae, and how much it's helping in an amazing cooperative arrangement. But development was transported from the life sciences and biology, 
as an expression of freedom and self-direction and self-organization into economics to become the opposite. And in fact, as Wolfgang Sachs in his book, The Development Dictionary, has pointed out, 1949 is the exact year when Robert McNamara, the head of the World Bank, declared that our part of the world was underdeveloped and your part of the world was developed. And the indicators of development were first. If you, know, if you were using fossil fuels, then you were developed. Even though you have a now an amazing transition down movement to transition out of fossil fuels. And in that language and vocabulary of development, you are underdeveloping. But in the context of climate change peak oil, you know you have. If you're a living system, then you have to make a living response. And that transition is a living response. So over the many, many years, I have both experienced the way that economic notion of development, which in staying alive I call maldevelopment, ends up distorting every system to try and be something else. So when we had the Chipko movement, you know, um, the Himalayan forests, are forests of diversity. We have oak and we have devdar and we have pine and we have hundreds and thousands of herbs. The Himalaya is the richest source of medicinal plants in the world. But, you know, when the British were planning forestry for India, they were looking at timber mines. And as has been said in text after text of forestry and forest <laughs> development and scientific forestry, those forests are unproductive. And I've, debate, I've debated with foresters, and they say, you know, the problem with the oak tree is it chooses its own way. Yeah. So they want the linear trees. And in the mountains, it's the pine, the tree pine, and in the plains it's the eucalyptus. So they take this diversity and say it's not producing anything because they're looking at the forest from the perspective of the timber market and commodity trading. So first of all they say the species are wrong, the forest must be changed, and you make plantations. And when the women were fighting to stop the logging, they were also fighting to stop the conversion of natural forests to these monoculture plantations of commercial species. Um, and the next step of development that I came across was this thing called the Green Revolution. Um, these days when we talk green, we mean sustainability. <coughs> In the 60s when the Green Revolution was introduced, and they must have had a huge PR machinery to think of the num word Green Revolution, just like they have a massive PR machinery picking up a Mark Linus one day and a um, Florence from Bugo another day and a C.S. Prakash. You know, I've done this work for so long now, I've had to go through about 30 PR spinners in the GMO debate. But at that point, the Green Revolution was given the word green because it was not red. <laughs> China was going red. And this was the reductionist package of development. We'll develop agriculture through chemicals and new seeds. And um, the peasants will never, ever take to the gun. So we'll have peace, we'll have prosperity, and they even gave, gave the Green Revolution a Nobel Peace Prize. And in 1984, the land of the Green Revolution had erupted into the worst terrorism that we have had. More people were killed in the Punjab terrorism than in other extremist events um, like 9-11. 9-11, we lost 5,000 lives. Punjab, we lost 30,000 lives. So I said, this is not creating peace. So what was the Green Revolution? I started to try and understand. And having been through the <coughs> teachings of the women of Chipko, who'd never been to school, who didn't know how to read and write. I used to be their scribe. Um, I had uh, developed a training in seeing the monoculture of the mind and also seeing through a diversity of the mind. And here are these farms that are called productive. 
I'm looking and saying, no, 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 they're not half as productive as our little farms because they're growing nothing but rice in one season and wheat in another season. And rice never grew in Punjab. So development was take a land of corn and mustard, and the, the, the regional dish of Punjab is makki ki roti sarso ka saag, yeah? corn bread and mustard greens. You don't see mustard in Punjab now. You don't see corn in Punjab now. It's rice and wheat, rice and wheat, rice and wheat, with lots of chemicals. We had extremism in the 80s, 90s we started to have a build up, building up of the suicides, because now you had the second green revolution added up, which was Monsanto's genetically modified BT cotton seeds. And I've just received a letter uh, asking me to send a message because the, having messed up the soils, having messed up the biodiversity, there's a cancer train that leaves Punjab. 33,000 people have died of cancer in the last five years, based on the most recent health report from Punjab. 33,000 people have died of cancer. And there's a train that leaves called the cancer train. Now, none of these costs ever, ever get added up. What used to get added was how much corn, uh, how much rice and wheat is going out. And then it would go into these go-downs and rot two million tons a year or what. Because you're creating monocultures, creating commodities, there's too much of that and too little of everything else you need. So the monoculture calculations allows you to have the illusion you're producing more but you're actually producing less. And then they applied the same logic to fish through what's called aquaculture. And it's called the blue revolution. Now, you know, by and large, like I said, acorns become oak trees. Water goes from the land to the sea. But According to development, this is all very wrong. Nature's deficient, people are deficient, ecosystems are deficient, the species are all wrong, every human being is wrong, everything has to be fixed. Fixing everything is development in that economic sense. So shrimp aquaculture is what was exploding in India with World Bank aid. And um, again, the argument was there's too little shrimp. But shrimp should be little. It's a luxury consumption. And it's not that we weren't growing shrimp. And it wasn't that there wasn't shrimp in the ocean. We have the most amazing cultivation system in Kerala. And it's called Chemmin Ketu. Chemmin means shrimp. Ketu means the farming of shrimp. In, in the low rain season, in the backwaters, they cultivate shrimp. And in the high rainfall time, when the salinity is little less, they cultivate paddy, which is salt-resistant paddy, a particular variety called pokali. So you grow the paddy, it leaves its straw and everything, and then the shrimp eats all that as food, and then the shrimp droppings become the fertilizer. If you add the rice and the shrimp, you have a lot of food. But when you look from the market, all you see is shrimp and say, no, not producing enough. Or when you harvest at sea, there's this amazing phenomenon of throwing away 50% of what's caught as bycatch. So they started to create aquaculture farms called intensive aquaculture farms. And these were on the land. So now you had to pump the water from the sea to the land the opposite way in which water flows. And were the shrimp dropping from the heavens? No. There was a whole new science evolved to make pregnant shrimp lay their eggs in captivity because shrimp have a rebellion. You know, native plants practice satyagraha against chemicals. I realized that while studying the Green Revolution. The reason they had to bring new seeds was the old seeds didn't want chemicals, and they would lodge. They'd say, no, I don't want you. Go away, chemicals. 
And they couldn't introduce chemicals into Indian agriculture because of the plants. So they had to re-engineer the plant for the chemicals. And that's what the Green Revolution is called. They made dwarf varieties that could be pumped up with a lot of chemicals. And now you lost the straw. Many of you must have read Matsunobu Fukuoka's One Straw Revolution. That's all in the straw. The straw is the food for the microorganisms. The straw is the food for animals. And if we are not recycling that, there's no food for us. So we were breaking the chain of recycling nutrients. Um, and just as in the Green Revolution, there was this rebellion of plants, of indigenous plants, open pollinated plants, free seeds, against the application of chemicals. When shrimp are caught at sea, pregnant shrimp, they refuse to lay their eggs in captivity. So you know what they do? And this is all development. People get PhDs for this. I've heard this from a person who got a PhD in Norway. They pull out the eyes of the pregnant shrimp. And in that trauma, she lays the eggs. Then they stock the ponds. So it's the same fish that would have laid that many eggs in sea, and you'd have had free swimming shrimp. Some would have been eaten by humans, and others would have been in the food chain. Besides capturing these pregnant fish, the other thing I've seen them do is, um, you know, the, the fish come to, uh, to lay their eggs in, uh, in the mangroves. They hire young kids that high to catch the fingerlings. And I've seen them, you know, in, with a little net, with that chalneen with which we separate the shaft from the flour mm. in the Indian kitchen. With that, they pick up a thing and they lick them and they put them into this container and then it's put in the stock. So nothing is being created. And then because they've stocked so much shrimp together, they get diseases. Like in factory farms, animals get diseases. So they pump them with all kinds of antibiotics. And that's it. So every day the water's polluted. Every day they've got to throw that polluted water out to the sea. And now they kill the rest of the fish that's coming to the coast. The sea is polluted. You brought salt water onto the land and that starts to seep. So you start destroying the paddy cultivation around. And that's how I got involved in this issue. Some women broke these ponds because their water was disappearing because now the water is salt water and then there's no fr fresh water, no sweet water there. So the women broke the ponds and then they were, obviously there were cases against them and they called me and helped us out and so I, I, never, I don't eat fish, I've never seen this kind of phenomena. I did the study and as a result of the study we did the Supreme Court. In our study we found out two things. One is if you really take all the ecological destruction into account, for every acre of a shrimp farm, 200 acres are being destroyed. That's the ecological footprint. For every dollar made in trading shrimp across the world, $10 of local economy is being destroyed. For every person who's given employment, and the only employment in a shrimp farm is to throw the feed, intensive feed, and, and the funny thing is the same feed is given to fish and same feed is given to chicken, it's all the same. And through the antibiotics, all of that, and then harvest it. That's it. There's no other word. Um, for every job in a shrimp farm, 15 livelihoods are destroyed in fisheries and farming. And we've become so clever at saying, We've created development. We developed the shrimp. We developed aquaculture. We developed agriculture. Um, as a result of our study, the Supreme Court ruled at that time that um, this industrial shrimp farming must stop. And only artisanal shrimp cultivation, like the Pokali, you know, can stay. Otherwise, only harvesting and fish. And the World Bank, when they tried to push this kind of thing, they said, 
You know, we used to have hunter gatherers and then we had farmers. So fishing sustainably is the hunter gatherer stage of fishing. Now we must have factory farming of fish. That is development. <laughs> um, Eucalyptus monocultures were introduced in the name of development. Now, not only in forests, but in farmlands. And uh, our studies in the 80s led to a major change in forestry policy after that. Because we started to get the government to count the ecological functions you know, of what any ecosystem is providing. You know, eucalyptus plantation destroys the water, destroys the wildlife, destroys <coughs> the other biological productivity. So in effect, one could say that, you know, because what's called the economy at the end of it has to be interacting with living systems, living communities, living societies, what it's actually doing is saying, you know, the corn should not become a corn plant. The acorn should not become an oak tree. And everything is about how to make the acorn become a coconut. <laughs> and that's literally what's happening with genetic engineering. So one of the things that, you know, your, your Mark Linus, because he is from this country, um, is now saying is people like me are creating a holocaust. Because we have critiqued something called the golden rice. Now, we, India had 200,000 varieties of rice. The Green Revolution destroyed the most. After we started Navani and started collecting seeds wherever we could, we rescued 3,000. And 3,000 is very small compared to 200,000, but hell of a lot when you compare to the monocultures. And when we started, we weren't, because we were just doing it to save the freedom of the seed and the freedom of the farmer, we weren't saying, what is this seed good for? We were just saving it. Now, 87 I started. By 1999, we'd had a horrible cyclone. And it was the salt tolerant seeds we had saved that allowed us to rebuild agriculture in Orissa. And once the farmers were using the salt tolerant seed, which has been evolved by nature and farmers, and not one, 500 varieties. And every variety, the name tells you farmers knew it was tolerant to salt. When the tsunami took place and all those waves came and destroyed farmland in Tamil Nadu, our farmers of Orissa donated two truckloads. Because I went down and the agriculture department says we can't farm anymore. For five years we'll have to put for agriculture aside. I said, no, you can. We have salt foreign seeds. This said, can't be. You know, there's always this question, can't be. And uh, so he said, no, we bring it. And, and it was distributed. And, and agriculture bounced right back in that season. And we don't know how much more it has spread because we are not very good at monitoring. We don't have giant staff. We have very, very good small team. And then drought started to become more frequent because of climate change. And we had saved seeds of crops we called forgotten fruits. Crops that are not, were not being eaten anymore. And we were popularizing them. And usually these are the best crops in nutrition terms. But the only problem is, A, they're not globally traded, so they haven't been messed up. And therefore there's no money in the seed. If you wonder why there's so much gluten allergy in wheat, it's because the breeding or the in industrial breeding of wheat for industrial processing has increased the gluten content in wheat. So Monsanto comes to India and patterns an old wheat variety with no gluten. Wheat can have no gluten. And they thought they patented there'd be this huge market. I mean, every day in the shoe market there's always one option, gluten free. But our wheats are gluten free because they haven't been bred for an industrial process. We had to fight this case uh, as we fought the case on patenting of neem and bas basma bean. 
Basmati Umar Valley, patented by a company in Texas called Rice Tech. That's the other thing, you know. You apply tech to anything, it's developed. Yeah? Even the stolen Basmati is now a developed Basmati. And Basmati means the queen of aroma. So they took the Basmati, patented it, patented the height of the plant, the length of the grain, the aroma, because it's an aromatic rice. And Basmati means the queen of aroma. And they sell it in the trade name Texmati, which sounds like the queen of Texas. <laughs> Even on the salt tolerant uh, crops, they're being patented. 1,500 patents. And I, have, I know so many environmental friends who are saying, but we must have genetic engineering because how will we deal with climate change without it? And then you ask them a little more and they say, you know, no, we need new climate resistant traits. I said, do you think genetic engineering creates climate resilience? It can't. Climate resilience is a multi-genetic trait. All that we've had in all these years of genetic engineering is single gene transfer. And the genes that have been transferred are toxic genes. A toxic gene of Bt, which creates a pesticide. So now, you know, cotton and corn were plants. This distorted development says, no plant, you must now be a pesticide. And in the United States, these Bt crops are approved as a pesticide. Not as a plant. And then they're allowed to be eaten. And when you want labeling, they say no labeling. For the golden rice, what they did was they tried to turn rice into a carrot. Right? Because carrot is what we get the tomato from. It's just one of the many, many crops. Um, you know, in Indian cuisine, we have coriander, curry patta. We have this beautiful tree called the drumstick tree. And these are the sources of rich vitamin A, also rich iron. And, uh, you know, you sprinkle a few leaves, produces 1,400 micrograms of beta carotene, the precursor of vitamin A, per 100 grams. So those are the usual units they use. How much is the golden rice going to produce? 34 micrograms. And the Mark Lionesses are saying, we are creators of Holocaust by preventing what I call the blind approach to blindness prevention. They tried, they tried illegally three times over. They tr had trials in China on children without telling the parents that this was genetically engineered rice. They have illegal trials going on in Philippines right now. They tried in India, we spoke there. And the 80 patents related to this one rice. The companies involved keep saying, we'll give the patent away for free in the beginning. But I said, you really want to do it for philanthropy, give it away forever. But they want everyone to start having golden rice. And then we forget the other sources of vitamin A. And then it's made compulsory because of development aid. And the FAO comes in and Bill Gates is already in there. And all the money starts moving to make people forget that there are other sources of vitamin A, richer sources of vitamin A. And that's why I'm so happy you're doing the permaculture as a transition. Because the big issue in a distorted development that, is, that went from the richness of the term in biology into economics, and now it's changing biology in terms of an externally controlled, externally directed, external input, non-sustainable system. So no plant is right, no seed is right, no community is right, no ecosystem is right. Um, we are now being told Indians shouldn't be eating rice. They want us to eat potatoes and become like the Irish. <laughs> because unless you change the diet, how do you have control? Way back during the Vietnam War, um, Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, who was the Secretary of State, had said, you know, when we give arms, we control armies. But we've got to break the cooperative spirit of the Viet Cong 
Because when you plant paddy, you all have to go together and do the transplanting together. It has to be a community affair. And this advice is making them very, very strong together. So let's get them used to white bread. And uh, they started to donate bakeries, flour, shipments of wheat. And that's the first time the term food as a weapon was created. And Kissinger said, when you control food, you control people. What was wrong with the Green Revolution in industrial agriculture? It was focused on single monocultures. And now instead of realizing that no, we, sh we should have plants that give we should have plants that give us good vitamin A, plants that give us uh, iron, plants that give us magnesium, plants that give us different things. And no plant gives you only one thing. We want to take something that isn't the richest source of vitamin A. We do have a rice, a red rice, uh, up in the mountains, which, which gives more vitamin A than the golden rice. But I don't say let's have this rice rather than the golden rice. Because, you know, no, no, there's gardens everywhere. Rich in all nutrients. Vitamin A deficiency isn't the only one. And even this deficiency is a result of industrial agriculture. In our fields, when I was growing up as a child, pre-green revolution, and my mother had a farm and uh, she chose it to become a farmer, uh, and we would go harvest. So you grew wheat, normally as a mixture with chickpea, mustard, and then there would always be a volunteer crop in wheat fields called batwa. I think it's called lamb's ears. Mm. Wonderful. My grandmother used to make the, the most delicious dishes with it. You can put it in yogurt and make a nice arayata. You can put it in flour and, you know, got the richest vitamin A, got the richest iron. But then they started the Green Revolution, so now you had to have the dwarf wheat and you had to get rid of everything else because now they were weeds and they were competitors. So when they applied a fertilizer, this volunteer crop was also grown tall and they didn't want it. So they applied herbicides and they killed the sources of vitamin A and iron in the industrial agriculture package. They and the poorest of families, even a landless woman, could go collect a few greens in the field and cook for her children. So first they create the deficiency, and then they bring another solution in their, in, 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 in their point of view to get rid of one deficiency, but they're going to create many, many more deficiencies. Because when you get rid of all of that diversity, there are other nutrients you need. So we've now recently produced a report, we've, we've done two. One is called A New Paradigm for uh, Food Security. We're saying we, we shouldn't be looking at monoculture yields. Because they go into container ships. They rot in go downs. They're eaten by rats. They go into cars to make biofuel. <coughs> or they go to torture animals. This is not food. It's not creating food. Food is the currency of life. The food web is the web of life. <coughs> Everything is eating something else in an amazing language. And we are not the top of the food pyramid, as nutrition charts used to show. We could actually be at the bottom. <laughs> because the microorganisms get you at the end. <laughs> I mean, if there's anything at the top of a food pyramid, it's the microorganism. And they keep the world going. They're the ones responsible for feeding us. They're the ones responsible for uh, making sure the food web works. And we now, when we do training for farmers at our farm, uh, we've been gifted these microscopes. And we bring soil from chemical farms and we bring soil from the Nathania farm. And we allow farmers to see. Because the soil from the chemical farms is dead. There's nothing moving in it. There's no life. And the soil from ecological organic farming is rich. And every once in a while we'll bring a soil ecologist in and they'll find more and more species coming home. Just like pollinators, just like birds. 
Once you create the hospitable environment, agriculture can be a rich source of biodiversity. And yet, again, the Mark Linus kind of propaganda says ecological agriculture is responsible for destroying biodiversity. And industrial farming because it's more productive. But you measure productivity in such a false way. You don't see all the resources you pull in and waste. The ten times higher use of water, all the chemicals that go in, all the debt that's, that's created. And the highest tragedy of farm debt is what has happened with the takeover of seed by Monsanto through the genetically engineered cotton. They brought in BT cotton to India in 98. And in this period now, we have lost more than a quarter million farmers who committed suicide because of debt. And, and, uh, and the story is usually the same. The farmer is told he'll be very rich, get rid of your old seed. He goes, signs of his land as for credit, the crop fails or does badly, he's eventually in debt, and then the agents that sell the seed and chemicals say, your land is mine. That day the farmer goes to the field, drinks pesticide, ends his life. 270,000 farmed. So I've been telling Polly Higgins, you know, ecocide and genocide are two sides of the same picture. The same kind of agriculture as war which we call agriculture development, is killing the bees, 75% gone, killing the soil organisms, killing our farmers, and now destroying our health. Now, is, uh, isn't it a weird situation that all, all of you have no control over the food you eat? They can just take horses, butcher them up, and feed your horse meat, <laughs> and you don't know. I call it beef burger. Huh? And call it beef. And call it beef burger. <laughs> now, to me, that's the really big issue facing us. That we are up against a highly wasteful system overall across the economy, but with agriculture at its heart. 75% of all ecological destruction on the planet has been caused by an industrial model of farming. 75% species destruction, 75% land destruction, 75% water destruction, and 40% greenhouse gases. The biggest single impact on the planet is an agriculture that came out of the war economy. Because what's, what's the line of this development? During the war, industry emerged to find chemicals to kill. The, after the wars, they didn't want to give up. Rachel Carson has written about this in a book, Silent Spring. Sir Albert Howard has written about it in the Agricultural Testament. That an industry addicted to profits during time of war did not stop selling those chemicals and redesigned them as pesticides, fertilizers, herbicides, etc. Agent Orange was used in the war in Vietnam. They're now making genetically modified seeds resistant to Agent Orange. <coughs> Chemical fertilizers were made in factories that were earlier explosive factories. And very often people are smart enough to realize they can take it right back to make explosives. Just think of the number of terrorist attacks that have been fertilizer bombs in recent years. I met a high-level diplomat from the U.S. after I'd given a talk on chemical agriculture. He said, gosh, you're so right. We distributed so much fertilizer to counter the Soviets that all over Afghanistan, there's fertilizer lying in every house. And people just have to reconstitute it to make it a bomb. So many of the terrorist attacks in India have been fertilizer bomb. The Oslo, the young man in Oslo, who blew up the government office and then shot uh, uh, the young people on the island, that bomb, he was buying fertilizer over months and months and months and accumulating it in his bomb. And then he made these bombs. So the entire chemical arsenal in agriculture is a war arsenal. The mentality is a war mentality. In the web of life, Nothing is at war with anything else. It's an harmony. 
Yes, they'll be in sick beds, but they're not threatening you. When you look at any textbook on agriculture, the pests are going to gobble you up. So you've got to declare a war against the pests. You've got to declare a war against hunger. You've got to declare a war against this. You've got to declare a war against everything. And that mentality of war has so seriously shaped the way we think of what we are developing. Even genetic engineering, the tools used in genetic engineering, the main tool is a gene gun. They shoot a gene into the cells of a plant. And the other tool is a cancer. It's biological warfare. You infect a plant with a cancer so that through the cancer you carry the new gene you want to put into it, which doesn't belong there. So, you know, plants weren't supposed to be pesticide factories. You're making them pesticide factories. Rice wasn't supposed to be carrot. You wanted it to be like a little mini carrot. <laughs> Agriculture itself is turning ecosystems into something they weren't meant to be. I mean, look at the beautiful hedgerows of this country. But every hedgerow comes in the way of the giant machinery, so it must be chopped down. Every tree on a farm comes in the way. So agroforestry must go. And you privilege the chemicals, you privilege the tractors, and you call that development. If you look at agricultural development, those are the indicators. How much chemical is being used, how much machinery is being used, and look at the treadmill on which our farmers are caught. Yeah. I was told, how much was it? 5,000 cows in one place? Mm, 8,000. 8,000. They want to create a dairy at 8,000 cows in one place. You know, on one of my very early trips, my son had come with me. He was 8 or 9 years old. And he used to cycle around. And uh, one day he comes back to me. And he used to do book binding with Mary, I remember. Mm. But he comes back to me and says, Mama, the cows here are very sad. They're always crying. Hmm. There is always a running way. And the others are so big. Yeah. Because the cow hasn't been allowed to be itself, it's now a milk machine. Everything is being forced to be something other than it is through violence, coercion, and imposition. So development which was self-expression, self-evolution, self-organization is now external control, domination, forcing. At the level of the technology like genetic engineering, it is forcing every plant with wilds. Now, none of that genetic structure stays normal. If you look at the studies on genetic engineering, it's a scrambling of the genetic structure. And... Um, the other day I was traveling through Rajasthan where we have uh, seed conservation and the government had signed an MOU with Monsanto so we were working to have it that cancer and we picked up a corn. Monsanto is bringing new hybrid corn in that area and it was so strange that you know you normally have a corn cob and then you have this light green cover and you have the tassels. From the light green cover dark green leaves of corn was starting again. If you remember Dolly, the sheep that was cloned, she was one of the 173 clones. Everyone else was deformed. Everyone else was deformed. And they wanted permission to, to turn it into your beef burger. Because Dolly is dead, she's in a museum, totally failed. They wanted to make a pig bigger for the pork industry. So they put a human growth hormone into the pig. But it was totally disproportionate. The poor pig couldn't stand. It couldn't stand. It was always lying down. So you want human genes and pigs. And even this wheat trial you've had, I, I haven't yet figured out. They talk about cow-like genes in it. Now, I don't know what a cow like gene is. But there was a Mr. Dr. Bishop who in Cambridge was trying to do cabbage with scorpion genes. 
um, they're putting flounder genes into tomato to be able to grow tomato somewhat northwards. Mm. Yeah, where there's freezing. So it's all coming from this idea that nature is wrong, people are stupid, and we've got to fix it. And we are smart. And when it comes to the seat, which is where all this control is coming, and industry is genetically modifying the seed in order to collect royalties and patents from it, suddenly in the last two decades, everything about the seed has changed. Earlier farmers were breeders, they're not breeders anymore. Farmers had freedom to have their own seed, it's illegal to have your seed. There's a new seed law in Europe, 2010, making your open pollinated seed illegal. The breeding was for qualities of diversity, nutrition, taste, if you wonder where the taste went in food, it went out of the window through development of the plant. Because now what do you want plants to do for you? What do you want seed to do for you? Uh, first you want it to be a carrier of chemicals, so you do herbicide resistance, so you can sell more herbicides. Second, you want more industrialization. They're now changing, first they change corn to be more cattle feed, now they're changing corn to be more biofuel. Yeah? So when human beings will eat the corn, they'll eat leftovers of the biofuel industry. Another quality that is worth, uh, useful for long distance globalized trade <coughs> is long shelf life. In a local economy, in a transition movement, freshness is a virtue. And with freshness comes quality and taste. But for a globalized system, staleness becomes a virtue and hiding that staleness. I remember the ecologist once had a wonderful uh, store, uh, issue on what's happening to food. And they had a story of how lettuce that has been flown from thousands of miles away, how much chemical has to be put on it to make it look <coughs> fresh. And one of the oldest genetically engineered products introduced was something called the flavor saver tomato. Do you remember? Now the flavor saver tomato was basically a tomato in which they had done a genetic engineering to not allow the tomato to show that it was now rot. So it could sit on a shelf for six months. And I call, call it the equivalent of the botoxin. You know, you're 80 years old or 60 years old and you have wrinkles and I would be very proud to show my wrinkles to say I'm that old, I have that much experience. But they've convinced people that beauty is getting rid of your wrinkles, so you paralyze your skin with this Botox injection. So in effect, that tomato is a Botox tomato. But it was so horrible. We didn't have a movement in, in uh, the US at that time against genetic engineering. There were no consumers saying we don't want it because it's genetically engineered. It was so bad, nobody took it. <laughs> and Jeremy Rifkin did a press conference where he took this tomato that wasn't rotting, and he threw it against the wall and it bounced back. Like <laughs> <laughs> and again, if you wonder why, you know, earlier you chopped up the tomato, you put it in a pan, it dissolved, it became a nice gravy. For us in Indian cooking, we, we needed it. Now you chop up the tomato, it sits there like a piece of salmon. It doesn't dissolve. Because it is now being bred for ketchup, or sauce, or industrial products, not for fresh eating. Um, in the last year, I've had two, you know, two interesting incidents with my government. One was, uh, the government said, you know, Dr. Shiva, these people are coming and telling us our bananas are all wrong. We have 1,500 kinds of bananas. <coughs> and India is the biggest banana producer, but very little international trade. Because our, our bananas are so delicate, they can only be eaten locally. So we go to Kerala, which is the home of banana, you see, you know, the tiniest little tobacco shop, we'll have 30 kinds of bananas hanging there. 
So Del Monte, I think, comes and says, no, 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 your bananas are all wrong. Now you should take the planting material from us and change your bananas so you can export it. So I have to say, why do we have to export it? There's enough Central American and Latin American countries enslaved to export bananas. And then we have the most delicious mangoes. At the farm, we have nine kinds of mangoes. And uh, you know, mango is Mangafira indica. It's an Indian crop. Um, for mangoes too, they're saying all wrong. All wrong because most of our mangoes can only be eaten fresh. They don't have a long shelf life. They've got delicate skin. They're delicious. They have so many flavors. Now they want, you know, I call it breeding rocks. Yeah? Everything has to be like a hard, hard rock that you can put onto trucks, into containers, ship it long distance, and it sits like a rock and doesn't get damaged. And I was told by some people that South African farmers who supply um, um, apples to Walmart were told that apples had to be a certain size. And then Walmart changed the size of its trucks and told these farmers, chop your trees, plant the new one, because now the apples must be this size. So from the seed, the entire food system is being colonized. And it's from the seed we can reclaim our food freedom and our food democracy. So in Navdanya, we've been doing this 25 years in India, but uh, starting last year, I realized something so wrong across the world that we have to become one movement. And we started the Seed Freedom Campaign, and as a report, this will be in the Schumacher Library, uh, Seed Freedom Report, written by 150 organizations together because we believe in a participatory approach. And it's really the story of the seed that's happening to it. Both what people are doing in terms of protecting the seed. All the initiatives around the world on conservation, as well as stories of the criminalization of seeding seed. A very important case in Europe against the biggest seed saver, the equivalent of Navania in France called Coco Pelli, taken to court by the industry, saying they're distributing seeds is stealing the market. And so they must be stopped. And then we went to the European Court of Justice and the judges say there's a superior objective of food security. And therefore these seeds must be destroyed. <laughs> What's the superior objective? That Monsanto must control our seed. But Monsanto is not feeding the world. It's poisoning the world. Monsanto is killing our farmers. Monsanto is destroying our independent science. This afternoon there was a little discussion and Rachel at Schumacher was saying, you know, just say 10 minutes on what if there were no GMOs? Would the world starve? I said, no. If there were no GMOs, we'd have more food, more diverse food, more delicious food. We'd have more farmers. We'd have, we wouldn't have a seed dictatorship, we'd have no seed patterns, we wouldn't have corruption of our governments, we wouldn't have corruption of institutions, we uh, wouldn't have denial to people of knowing what's in their food, is it horse meat, is it GMO, is it what? The right to know would be exercised and practiced because it would not be a threat to anybody. So we need a GMO-free world. And when we talk of seed freedom, we talk of many freedoms as part of it. The first freedom is of the seed itself to evolve in that original idea of self-organized seed. And that means we celebrate diversity. Seed freedom is the right of the farmer to save seeds, exchange seeds, breed seeds. Seed freedom is the right of every eater to know what they're eating and therefore lend their support to seed that nourishes the planet, protects the bees, protects the soil organisms, um, gives us better health. So seed freedom is really an embodied freedom of the web of life. And we've decided to make Gandhi's birth anniversary the day of seed freedom. And from that day, every year, till we've driven out the GMOs, horse meat and our food, for those of you who eat meat, um, giant corporations like Monsanto strangling everything 
both the diversity of life as well as freedom and a democracy, uh, killing science, killing knowledge. Uh, from the 2nd of October to 16th of October, which is World Food Day, two weeks of deep discussion, awareness, seed exchange. I was told this seedy sisters in this town. And, um, and I think everywhere there should be seed banks. But these should not be museum banks. These should be the banks that then supply the gardens. Now, if you have a thousand acre, if a thousand acres are in the hands of a hundred farmers, you get more food out of that thousand acres. If that thousand acres is split over thousands of gardens, you get even more food. There's a inverse relationship between the size of what you farm and how much food you produce. The idea that large farms produce more is scientifically false, totally scientifically false. And so we're not only have we done the biodiversity calculation, we've now done the nutrition calculation and produced a book called Health Per Acre. Because if food is for nutrition and food is for health, we should be looking at how much health is it producing. And then all these golden rices look so silly. When we look at how much health and nutrition are we producing, every school with its kitchen garden, every community with a kitchen garden, you know, every war, in every war that's what people did. Met their food needs through kitchen gardens, they were called victory gardens. And if the giant corporations have declared war, then we need to have a transition to reclaiming our food system, both through the sea as well as the garden. And the call we are giving this year, and we hope all of you will join, we hope all of you will sign the Declaration for Seed Freedom that is on the Navdanya website, navdanya.org, as well as the seedfreedom.in website that's dedicated to this. Write and tell us about the gardens. But this year we are saying, let's have a worldwide absolutely self-organized free movement for seeds of freedom and gardens of hope. Because we have to cultivate hope. We have to cultivate freedom. None of this comes out of the blue. Just like a plant needs care. Every one of the human virtues that make life livable has to be cultivated. And I would end with a beautiful poem from Rumi that was given to me that day at the Nehru Center. I was just reading the flies and throwing away junk and keeping, and then I saw this beautiful poem from Rumi in this earth. In this earth, in this immaculate field, we shall not plant any seeds except for compassion, except for love. Exactly.